This morning our scripture will come from Genesis chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 9. Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have all have one language. And this is what they begin to do now. Now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not be understood by one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Names have always been important to us. That was true in Bible days and the story that we just read. A name was important to the people that were beginning to, re to build this tower that would reach into the heavens. Proverbs tells us that a good name is to be had over great treasures. It supports the idea of us carrying with us a good, profitable name. Today I want to talk about having no name. And this week I set out on a journey to kind of gather some stories, some thoughts about people and illustrations of people that had no names in our society. First thing that came to my thought, and maybe to many of yours, was the tomb of the unknown soldier there in Arlington, Virginia. I found out through a little bit of research uh, that there are actually four tombs to unknown soldiers in the United States different, and different, for different wars and things. And if you trust Wikipedia, which is not wise to do, but if you trust it, there's probably over 60 in the world uh, that we know of. they are tombs to unknown soldiers. It's not just a thing in our country, but we honor those that came back and because of their remains being unable to be identified for whatever reason, we honor those that people that have no name. If I tell you, say the words, a man with no name, some of you may be able to remember back to a set of westerns in the 70s that starred, starred Clint Eastwood. There were three different movies. It was a trilogy, and he had a different nickname in each of them. Does anybody remember that? Anybody? I see a couple of head nods. Okay, uh, that's good. Um, and he had no name. He had a different nickname in each one. Some of you might just think of the name John Doe or Jane Doe or Janie Doe, names that we use to identify people who are not known, whether it be for criminal purposes or whether it be a body that hasn't been identified as someone that we don't know their name. One story that was brought to my attention was from one of my aunts. And one of my aunts had lived next to a boy, and his name, even into his teenage years, was just Boy. That was the only name he ever had, was just Boy. And when they would go to the door, they'd say, Boy, come here. And he would answer, that was his name. Not necessarily a story of someone with no name, but I was reminded of my other aunt. Um, one of my other aunts, she went to, um, her parents were really struggling with what to name her when she was born. It was between Wilma Dean and Mary Ann. My aunt's not that old, she's uh, probably in her mid-40s. And her parents were really struggling it out. And it was generally thought that they had, settled on the, on the name Wilma Dean. And for the, until she went to kindergarten, her name was Wilma Dean. And there she went to register for kindergarten, and there on her birth certificate was Mary Ann. <laughs> I did a little research to make sure that I don't think we've got anybody named Wilma Dean in here today. That was probably the best going to kindergarten present a person's ever got. 
I'm reminded of uh, the comedian Henry Cho. Many of you know this story. Many of you heard it. He's a Christian comedian. He's a Christian and a comedian. He's a clean comedian. He's actually a deacon at a church in Nashville. But he tells the story of one of his friends, and he vows that it's a true story. His name was J.B. When I was asking around this week, I came across a similar story. Tim Shoemaker told me he knew a guy, I think his name was C.J., and he went to the military, and they said, what's your name, private? He said, C.J., and they said, no, sir, what's your name? C.J. C.J. was his only name. He wasn't given a birth name. So Henry Cho's friend went to, his name was J.B. That was his given name. It didn't stand for anything. It was just J.B. So when he went out to fill out the form to get his driver's license, he put J only, B only. Because he had learned over the years that it was best to go ahead and just tell people, you know, J only, B only. And of course it came back. He was on his driver's license, Jonely Bonely Stewart. Names are important to us. Names have probably taken on too much of a significance to us to some degree. The story we just read, the story of Babel or Babel, comes to us in Genesis chapter 11. We're only three generations removed from the flood at this time. Uh, We find that this land, Babel or Babylon, as we would later know in chapter 10, was under the control of Nimrod. Nimrod was the grandson of Ham, You'll recognize the name Ham as one of the sons of Noah that was on the ark. So this was just a few years back from the flood. This is a story that sometimes we relegate to our children's curriculum. It's one of those short Bible stories that has so much meat in it, so much good that we can learn from it. And it shouldn't be just relegated to our children's curriculum. Why did God stop the Tower of Babel? Ultimately, sin was the only thing that prevented these people from building this tower. As a matter of fact, they were going to be able to do some incredible things. They were going to be able to achieve some incredible things. But sin stood in their ways. What was that sin? We could try to find just one sin. I think the scriptures support that maybe the sin was not three sins, but at least the threat to God's plan it created a threefold threat to God's plan. So what was the threat of Babel or Babel? First, they desired to alter God's plan. God set forth in Genesis chapter 9, he tells Noah and his sons to be fruitful, multiply, and fill or disperse throughout the earth. God's plan was for the people not to centralize in one location, but rather to spread throughout the earth. These people, if you look in chapter 11, in verse number 6, uh, or verse number 4, you'll see, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. They felt that their strength and numbers would be diminished if they were dispersed the way that God intended for them to be dispersed. Secondly, they were headed back to a pre-flood earth. The problem with the situation as it was in, in before the flood, just a few generations before this, is sin had centralized in a very tight location. Most Bible um, scholars believe that the earth was much more centralized during this time, and God desired for the people to disperse. Part of the problem was sin had congregated into such a small area that sin overcame all the earth. They were condensing sinful and vain attitudes all into one place. And thirdly, and what we're wanting to focus our attention on today, is the fact that they were seeking to make a name for themselves. The scripture says that one of their desires in building this tower is so they can make a name for themselves. The sin in this is that God is the only name, the only one. God is a jealous God when it comes to his name. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. I want you to imagine with me as God saw them building this tower 
he came down. And that's probably a tongue-in-cheek reference to the fact that God, who Isaiah tells us sits above the big ball of the earth and the people look like mere ants, it's probably a tongue-in-cheek reference to the fact that they were building this tower, but God was still very much so coming down. He was still much, very much so greater than this. And there he sees one people with one language. And God says something interesting here and something that really goes against, and I'm going to say something here in a minute that may contradict your mind thoughts a little bit and what you would think it would say. But God says that nothing that they proposed was going to be impossible. The story here is that even without God, a group of unified people, a group that had it together with each other, it took a miracle to stop a group of unified people who didn't even have God. Now that sounds contradictory to us because we know that with God all things are possible. We know that we're supposed to find our strength and our unity with God. But I think the story here leads us to believe and understand that unity is a very, very powerful thing. It was the reason that God had to stop the threat of Babel. And the question comes to us and the question we have to answer is this. If nothing was impossible for a group of people who were united in all ways, but they sought their own interest, their own glory, imagine with me what it would be like if we were a group of people who are unified in all ways and all we're seeking to do is glorify the name of God on high. If nothing was impossible for a group of unified people without God, imagine what is possible with God. God's desire is for His people to be unified and to do great things. Um, Philippians 4.13 is a scripture we like to quote that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what Paul said. And Unfortunately, we kind of like, I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things. We like the idea of being able to do all things. And we like the idea that Christ strengthens us. But God connects the two with an important word there, through. We can only do all things through Christ who strengthens us. To be through Christ, we must be in Christ. You see, when we talk about the idea of unity, we need to remember that it was God's desire for us to have unity. And it was His not at the expense of truth, but by the knowledge of truth. God's desire for, was for us to know the truth, and that would lead us to unity. In John 14, 6, Jesus famously said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. The unity that God called for us was to come to Him through truth, through Christ, through the way, through the life. In John chapter 17, we read a passage there in verses 20 through 23 where Jesus is praying and he's about to be offered up on the cross for the sins of man. And he's praying a prayer specifically for his apostles. But he makes a note that's not just for his apostles. Begin reading with me in John chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. I do not ask for these only which would have been a reference to the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. The only way that these people were going to become perfectly one was to have the same unity, be on the same page, understand the same things, the same way that Jesus had the relationship with the Father. They were united by a common truth. The desire to make a name for ourselves may not be a collective problem. 
the problem with the people of Babel or Babel were they were collectively seeking a name for themselves. It was a collective big whole problem. But it may not be a collective problem. It may be an individual problem. Scripture points to Joshua chapter 7, beginning of verse 11, where we read the story of Achan. Maybe you know the story of Achan. Achan was a man who was of, of Israel, and God had made some very specific rules about what was supposed to happen as they went in and invaded countries. They were not supposed to take things, spoils, from the war. But Achan did. And the consequences felt for what Achan did were not just an individual consequence. The harm was done collectively. Beginning in verse number 11, Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. Notice with me that the people of God collectively could not stand because of the sins of one individual. And the takeaway for that for us is that one person who's seeking their own glory and good can hinder the work of the whole congregation. One person has the power to do so. Paul pointed out in Corinthians in the, seventh chap- in the fifth chapter, in verse 7 and 8, about people who were seeking their own glory. He said, cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. The people of Corinth were dealing with some people that were living among them and worshiping with them. And they had some sexual sins and other sins that were were really bad. And what Paul points them to is that if you're going to be the kind of people, and remember the book of Corinthians is really all about getting the church at Corinth right. And he says if you want to be the right kind of church, if you want to get it right, if you want to get this problem you have with the Lord's Supper right, if you want to get this problem you have with sexual sins right, here's what you've got to do. He says you've got to get rid of the leavening. And he says, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven. And he points out what this leaven that had to be purified and cleansed was. He said, that leaven is malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He called the people to a new way of unity. And he pointed out that one person could harm the whole bunch. I tried to find some apples this week. I actually asked on Facebook if anybody had some bad apples, but apparently we throw away our bad apples, which is a good thing. Um, Nobody had a bad apple. But the analogy that comes to mind is, we've all heard it, one bad apple ruins the whole bunch, right? And we believe that and know that and understand that one bad person can ruin the whole gathering of people. What happens when you put one good apple into a bunch of bad apples? One good apple cannot stand it will eventually turn into a bad apple. The analogy here is that the power of one is so important, the power of each individual, the need for each individual to be connected and involved and seeking holy, bigger things. I want to do something just a little bit different. I want you to close your eyes with me for just a minute. Closing our eyes sometimes gives us some greater focus, and I want to ask some questions. I want you just to kind of imagine with me. Imagine with me what kind of world we could create if we did not, as a collective people, seek a name for ourselves. Imagine with me what if we became so radically different that our names individually didn't matter anymore. What if we had no name? What if we did absolutely nothing to promote our own name? What if when people saw us, they didn't think about us at all? They only saw Christ living in us. If a good name is to be chosen over great riches, is there a better name to wear than that of the name of Christ? You open your eyes. The plea is for us to simply be Christians. 
the plea is for us to be united by the blood of Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, and the directions he left behind for us. If you're not a Christian today, I want to tell you a brief story. It's a story that you may have heard before, but a story that maybe we all need to hear again. There was an unremarkable lady living in the town of Nazareth. Her name was Mary. God came to this woman in a miraculous way, and he told her that while she was a virgin, she would have a child. See, she was scheduled or committed to be married, but she was still a virgin. Her husband-to-be, Joseph, initially found out about the pregnancy and wanted to put her away quietly. He was a good man, not wanting to embarrass her. But God revealed himself to him as well. The life of Jesus that we begin here, we don't have extreme details about them. We know some about his very young life. We know from Luke 2.52 that he grew in the ways that God would desire all of us to grow. But until he's about 30, we don't know a whole, whole lot about his life. But at 30, about the age of 30, he began to reveal himself. He revealed that he was the Son of God. And through a series of miracles and 12 followers and teachings that were greater than the world had ever heard before, before the age of social media or cell phones or television or radio, in just three short years, He began to turn the world upside down, and to this day it has not been flipped up again. The world didn't know what to do with Jesus. They had not seen anything like him before. They were baffled. They did what many of us do when we see things we're not familiar with. They rejected him. They beat him. They nailed him to a Roman cross. And there he bore the sins of men. You see, we had a sin problem. We still have a sin problem. But it took a perfect human sacrifice to make it right. Jesus was the only answer. Some of the very people who stood by and watched him hung on a tree, just a few weeks later were at a festival. A festival of the Jewish people. It was the festival of Pentecost. They heard a sermon. That sermon changed the world forever. It was told to them in detail exactly what they had done. That they had put the Son of God, the Son of Man on a tree and crucified Him. They had indeed murdered the precious, sinless, humble Son of God. You see, Jesus didn't come for His own glory. He came for the glory of God. Paul tells us that he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when you're asked today to be nameless, It isn't literally about having no name. It's about taking the greatest name ever known to man and making it your own. When the Jews heard that sermon preached on Pentecost, they were cut to their hearts. They knew they were living in sin. The sins that they had committed put Jesus on the cross, both figuratively and literally. They realized that they were living a life to make a name for themselves. They realized that when they chanted, crucify him, crucify him, they weren't just asking for the condemnation and crucifixion of Jesus. They were asking for their sake, their cause, and their comfort to be exalted. They were asking for their name to be exalted. When they were shown that story in clear detail, they were cut in their hearts, and they realized sin ruled in their life. And they asked a simple but profound question, what must we do to be saved? The answer here could have been tough. It could have been be crucified as Jesus was, but it wasn't. The answer was profound and simple. Repent and be baptized. Turn away from the sinful nature that you're in and be baptized. Scriptures tell us that we are buried with Christ in baptism. And we rise to walk a new way of life. 
We go down into the water named Daniel, Alan, Dennis, Darnell, Scott, Kenny. And we come up simply Christian. We put away our own self and we seek a new way of life, a nameless way of life, a humble way of life where we seek the Savior instead of seeking the self. Whose name do you wear today? Is it all about you or is it all about Him? If for any reason you're living a life today that's not all about Him, we want you to make it right today as we'll stand and sing together. Yeah, no,